I'm very touched by that introduction. I'm going to acknowledge everyone uh, a few paragraphs down. But early, uh, I want to mention that the chickens are being drawn right now by a very famous graphic artist for the cartoon version of The Forgotten Man. And uh, they're very beautiful chickens um, <laughs> as metaphor for uh, government intervention. It's wonderful to be here. Um, uh, just on the way, I was hearing a little bit of sad news ab uh, about the economy, that durable goods orders weren't quite where they should be. The employment seems to be coming back a little too slowly. Um, so it feels a little disappointing. Uh, just as Mike said, there used to be a thing called growth, and we study it in think tanks, and we're working to get it. But it, it, it seems a little metaphorical and theoretical right now, doesn't it, strong growth? Uh, and we're hoping to bring it back. Um, we're wishing for the day when there would be 4% growth and when the unemployment would be below 5%. And we're wishing even more, I think everyone in this room will concede, um, for something closer to a balanced budget in Washington, to a smaller debt, to maybe a government that pays back the debt. And even behind that, even uh, in non-election years, we're looking for a leader who can take us there, right? Who can take us to a smaller government, who actually could shrink the government uh, and get us closer to, to growth and happiness. But when we face it, um, when we look at that, we, we begin to wonder, is that really possible in the United States? We've kind of downgraded our expectations a bit. Um, we don't, we're not pretty sure, we're just not sure about the entitlements, whether they could ever be fixed. Are, are, we're worried um, quite a bit about leadership. We're, we're wondering how many decades it will take to get back from to where we were before the recent setbacks. That's a long time frame. That is like the Great Depression. Um, we know there's a way to get back, but we don't have a leader, and we don't know how to get back. Um, so I'm, I'm here with a happy message um, through a medium. That, that I think we can get back. We can get back from a terrible situation. We've done it before. We have had such a leader who has taken us back. Um, we've had such an economy that was 4% real growth, at nominal, real, always. And that was what we can call the Coolidge economy after the president whose period belonged to, Calvin Coolidge, the 30th president of the United States. This isn't a history class, but you'll remember that he came to Washington as a vice president with Warren Harding. Harding died in 1923, very suddenly uh, Coolidge came in, was elected on his own in 24 and left in 1929. Um, well, for various reasons, different <coughs> reasons, um, both Hard, hard to understand, but there we don't know much about the Coolidge economy. We don't know much about Coolidge the man. In our history classes, we don't learn quite enough about them. If you look at the rankings of the 20s economy, it's not a long discussion. The numbers tell the story. It wasn't just a good economy. It was a great economy for a very long time. But you, you know, when we talk about the 20s, uh, especially in those history classes, there's sort of a sneer in our voice, whether we're Democrats or Republicans, Austrians or, or Keynesians, we, we kind of think they might have been a lie, all champagne, like in The Great Gatsby, right? And Coolidge, uh, likewise, is sort of in a shadow. Republicans know that Reagan liked him and moved his portrait, and that had something to do with unions and PACO. But he's not very high in the rankings, um, even among conservatives. He's not in any pantheon. Um, he's not on Mount Rushmore. I'm just writing right now about him and Mount Rushmore. He doesn't have a stellar reputation, does he, Calvin? Um, and he certainly wasn't popular with everyone in his day. Some people thought he was a Scrooge or worse, a Grinch. Uh, he was sour or said to be. He was from New England, you know, and he meant it. He was from Vermont. Uh, the Alice Roosevelt Longworth, the daughter of President Theodore Roosevelt, said Coolidge looked as though he had been weaned on a pickle. <laughs> so what we're going to talk about now is Coolidge, the Coolidge economy. Who was Coolidge, the man, um, to remind that it was great, not good. 
Um, there were others there who helped him along. I'll mention uh, some of the things that Harding, his predecessor, did. And then I'll talk a bit about how we can use that information today. Actually, I'm going to telegraph a bit right now and tell you the thesis of this talk. You've probably been to motivational lectures um, or psychology lectures, or you've seen books called Getting to Yes in a Negotiation. This is a business school. How do you get someone who doesn't want to to say yes? How do you say yes? You always say yes. Yes is there. The story of Coolidge is the opposite. It was all about, and this is what we'll speak about, getting to know with Coolidge, like a parent, like a teacher, like an authority. He always said no, and I'll tell you all about the art of saying no, which is almost an impossible thing to imagine a politician who said no well and often. But I'm going to tell you about it, and it takes a little bit, and so I'm grateful to Rex Singfield, my host, the Show Me Institute, to my friend Dr. Podgursky and Mrs. Podgursky, to Brenda Talent, to everyone here, to SLU, and to this business school, which I'm just getting to know, book, uh, for, for giving me this time. Uh, but to begin the story, go, go back to the beginning. I said we're in a dark time. Now, they were in a dark time then, in the early 20s. What did they have? They had inflation. That coming out of the war, they had inflation. They had to get rid of it. They had unemployment. They had unemployed veterans. Veterans today are a small crowd because of the way our milita military services is constructed. This was universal conscription veterans before antibiotics. That meant when they came back from the war, a good three in 10 were disabled forever missing a leg, you see. So veterans who needed help, there was a large lobby beseeching the government and walking the streets or going on strikes. They had large general strikes coming out of the war. They had unemployment that would not go away. They had trouble with railroads. They had tax rates that were in the 70s. There were enormous deficits. I was just trying to look at the scale of the debt and it went up from 1 billion to about 26 billion. Well, the whole federal government was only six billion. So all of a sudden, everything was wrong and everything seemed irreversible. And that is a little bit like today. There was policy that was different and we could talk about that, monetary policy and so on, but I'm going to concentrate on the, the leader's part in that policy. So you start with Harding, Coolidge's predecessor. Harding was a generous man, a wonderful man, a newspaper publisher from Marion, Ohio. He had served in the Senate. He was part of the U.S. Senate Brotherhood. He was elected, as I said, in 20 with Coolidge as vice president. And he actually laid the preconditions for that prosperity. He did good work. Harding saw taxes were too high. Deficits were obscene. Congress was running the show and spending. So he picked a good Treasury Secretary, Andy Mellon. He slashed the budget. That was brave and hard. He and Mellon cut the tax from the 70s down to the 50s. He vetoed some new spending with those veterans and their disability and their needs. That took political courage. Um, he said something that was quite useful also to Coolidge and would be useful to us now, which is that you can't always be in an emergency. You can't always do things just because things aren't going fine. And that crisis as justification is a, is a poor thing, that maybe you should waste a crisis. It's not a terrible thing to waste. It's wrong to exploit a crisis. You remember the phrase of Rahm Emanuel about how we should not waste crises and should use them to promulgate policy. Harding was the opposite. He said, avoid the crisis. Here's what Harding said when he was inaugurated. It sounds so different from what we say now that it's, it's good to hear uh, in, our, in our inaugurations. No altered system will work a miracle. Any wild experiment will only add to confusion. Our best assurance lies in efficient administration of our proven system. Well, he was not a president for change. <laughs> That's what they meant by normalcy. And we, we, again, we learned normalcy, it sounded stupid, right? Normal people are stupid. When we read the history books in the 20s, Harding's Normalcy was taught to us as something thick-headed, but it made a lot of sense. It was the opposite of uncertainty, normalcy, right? When you slow a pendulum and swing too wildly. So it's like this. Harding did begin to achieve that. 
Um, he also signed an important law, a technical law, the Budget and Accounting Act of 1921. Who cares what that's about? Well, it mattered a lot because it took back for the executive branch from the legislative branch a lot, much authority over the budget. The president had one budget instead of many to sign. The little departments didn't just run to Congress. The president could review the budget. He had a budget man, his own researcher, um, the head of the budget office, the forerunner to what we call the OMB um, director. And he had a wonderful power under this law that's now gone, the power to impound. That is to say, even if a department already had an appropriation that was in that budget, the president signed it, the president could still decide not to let the department have all that money. What? You only need three pencils. Give me back that fourth. And we all work in bureaucracies. We know what that would be like when they tell you you get four pencils, see you use only three, and take the other back from your drawer. <coughs> That's what that law did. But Harding was a man who tired. He got us somewhere. He got us somewhere, but then he got tired. The work wasn't really done when he began to give up. The industrial production was up, unemployment was down, but and he began to give up 22, 23. He didn't demonstrate saying power. His health ran out. He got tired of budget cutting. It was so mean. He figured he'd done a lot. The budget was down. He got tired of tax cutting. He brought the taxes down from 70 to 50. Wasn't that enough, he told people. Some of his staff turned out to be corrupt. Some of that story played out here, especially the part with the veterans bureaus, which took kickbacks. Um, several of his advisors were bad men. You've heard of Teapot Dome. And, and Teapot Dome was a concession that was essentially privatization. And when he gave it to his friends, this important oil concession, he cast a shadow over all privatization and said it's, it suggested it was just government favoritism. He liked cards, he drank a lot, he liked golf, he would practice his shots on the White House lawn. He had people to the White House for food and action, that's a quote from him. Senators loved him and couldn't believe that he'd even brought along Coolidge, that pickle from Massachusetts. Um, but we want to identify what was the trouble with Harding. His trouble was, even though he had the right philosophies, he was all about yes. He said yes to everyone. Yes, yes, yes. He was friendly, he was good at deals, he lived to make friends, and he agreed with his friends, and they conned him. He, he ended up wanting to give out money, to give out favors to people from his state, his gang, the gang from Marion. Harding once said, I have no trouble with my enemies, I can take care of my enemies in a fight, but my friends, my GD friends, they're the ones who keep me walking at night. And his effort began to fizzle, and he became ill. And he did indeed die in the summer of 23 August. He had a stroke, literally tired out. Coolidge said that, tired out. Um, and his plan had weakened long before that. So his reform was started, but incomplete. Enter Coolidge, the quiet president. Vice President, President by accident, right? Accident of an accident, said people who didn't like Harding either. A different type, not just a nominal Vermonter, but a real Vermonter who was inaugurated or sworn in rather by candle, the kerosene-like, very retrograde. His father had sworn him in, in Vermont. Um, people knew that Coolidge didn't even have a house that he bought. He rented, a president who rented? Half a two family? That was not very dignified, the people in the Senate thought. Where Harding had smiled, Harding was a handsome man. Coolidge kept his face intentionally expressionless. The portrait artist did not like that. They complained to the Wall Street Journal, to Clarence Barron. He was hard to paint. This New Englander, he was a former governor of Massachusetts. He'd been silent as vice president. Um, Charles Evans Hughes, the Secretary of State, came over to the White House as soon as Coolidge was president in August 1923, and he noticed something right away, whereas Harding had never been alone, always a friend there. Coolidge was alone in the office, smoking a cigar, looking at the paper. Coolidge made 
time to be alone and most important. And Hughes noticed this first, whereas Harding had said yes to things, you could count on Coolidge saying no. Some presidents are foreign policy presidents, some presidents are law presidents, some presidents are regulation presidents. Coolidge was a budget president, a budget man. He instantly antagonized everyone by being tough on outlays. They had thought Harding was tough, he was tougher. They thought they were done saving, nope. We must, I'm gonna quote him, we must have no carelessness in our dealings with property, public property, Coolidge said, or the expenditure of public money. Such a condition is characteristic of an undeveloped people. Hmm. What about being done, resting now on our loyals, laurels? Remember, they were coming out of recession, things were good. Listen to his language. I am for economy, and after that, I am for more economy saving, right? Hmm. Well, C Coolidge continued the policy job that Harding started and had grown weary at, and 58% or 50% top tax rate, that was too high for Coolidge. He wanted to cut it, and he and Mellon worked not a week, not two weeks, half a year to get legislation to bring that tax rate down. He made Mellon write a whole book. You know, this is a think tank, we produce books. You know how hard it is to write a book with a red cover about why taxes should be cut. Treasury secretaries in the United States at that time were not used to writing books to make their case, but Mellon did. It's called Taxation, the People's Business, and if you try to buy it on the internet now, it costs over $1,000, it was that good about why we need to cut the taxes. Their first effort, this legislation failed. They were miserable. Coolidge almost wanted to veto it. It was so poor because Congress sabotaged their effort. Did they give up? They did not. They made another tax bill. When, after Coolidge won in 1924, he pushed through his tax legislation, legislation, pushed it forward again. He pushed the tax rate down to 25% the top tax rate, and he gave the, a good share of his tax cut to the top earners because he believed that would make the country more productive. It did pass, this tax cut. It became law in 1926, and we know it because it was later the model for the John F. Kennedy tax cuts, the Reagan tax cuts, and the Bush tax cuts. Um, what else did Coolidge do in terms of saying no? Um, he, tr he budgeted. I mentioned it, I want to mention it again. It, they got the budget down to almost three billion, but he was determined to get it all the way to three billion. It was kind of a receding goal. Three billion, three billion, almost but never there. And here's where he really earned the title of being the man who said no. Because where everyone else wanted to stop cutting, he said no. He rejected, rejected, and rejected. He was an expert in the pocket veto, kind of an artist of the pocket veto, that way of vetoing something where you hold something till the vacation, Mrs. Talent knows about this, and then you veto it. He liked to do things like that. He, he was a farmer. He actually owned one-fifth of a cheese cooperative when he left the presidency. He had Holsteins, and yet he always turned his nose up at farmers who sought subsidy, and he said, well, farmers never made much money, and they won't now, I won't create a farming subsidy. Very, very tough, much hated, right? Um, how, how, how did he do all this? Um, he really didn't like new laws. He thought it was wrong to write them. He wrote his father a note about this. His father was also a lawmaker. It is more important to kill bad bills than to pass good ones. <laughs> How did he fight off big government? Well, personal style is important too. He's famous for being silent. You've heard silent cow, but his silence had a purpose. He noticed, he told other politicians that a big part of the job was people coming in asking for something all day long and you had to receive them. And if you didn't say a word, they would eventually run out of things to say, wouldn't they? <laughs> He would met with the press a lot, two times a week. We, we, um, we digitized his calendar for this project, and I hope to put it on the internet. And you'll see press meeting, press meeting, press meeting, but he never gave them anything to say. So he cut government by being boring. He bored for America. If nothing was going on, no crisis, no plan, then people might forget about the government. That was his theory, and expect less of it. And there's one writer, Walter Lippmann, who captured that in Coolidge the way that he bored the world to turn their attention away from government. 
The White House is extremely sensitive to the first symptom of any desire on the part of Congress or executive departments to do something. <laughs> the skill with which Mr. Coolidge applies his wet blanket is technically marvelous. There has never been Coolidge's equal in the art of deflating interest. The naive statesman imagines it is desirable to interest the people in government that indignation at evil is useful. Mr. Coolidge is more sophisticated. He has discovered the value of diverting attention from the government, and with an exquisite subtlety that amounts to genius, he has used dullness and boredom as political device. Nothing was going on. People went about their business and did other things. Um, he was much sharper, though, than his reputation said. He used his wit to kill projects or entreaties. A White House visitor, um, I like this story, came to sing the praises of a would-be ambassador to London and spent long minutes, maybe half an hour, listing the candidate's charms. I'm sure you were aware of the many considerations in his favor before, this mendicant said. Yes, said Coolidge, less now. <laughs> you took too long telling me, right? Um, twice a year, Coolidge and his budget director, who happened to be a general, and that was on purpose to be scary, had a meeting with the government staff, kind of pep talk, mandatory command performance, Continental Memorial Hall, where the DAR is in Washington. And in that meeting, they would exhort them to cut their budgets. For my book, I've been reviewing the minutes of these meetings, and there's something unlike anything we've heard about. The president and his budget director would yell at their cabinet. You didn't cut enough. You didn't cut enough. In a, in a very uh, inappropriate, patronizing way that we would not like. Um, if they cut, they needed to cut more. Well, first they had established a 2% club where the important heads, you know, the cabinet members, the heads of departments, got a sticker how humiliating if they cut 2% of their budget. And, well, that proved too hard after a while because they've been cutting. So then there was a 1% club where you got a sticker or something like that if you cut 1% of your budget uh, more than, than they thought. And when they, they couldn't do that anymore, they had a woodpecker club where you got to be an honorary woodpecker if you pecked away a little bit at your budget. <laughs> You can't make it up. And the, the effect was that they held the line. It worked. When Coolidge went and left office in 1929, this is the one-liner you need to know about him, all you need to know, the federal budget, as we said, was smaller, smaller than when he came in. Real terms, nominal terms, and terms. I told you, I'm tell you a little bit more, and then we'll move forward about saying no. Um, one of the things about being president is that it's tiring. Um, when I looked at that calendar and saw all those press meetings and all those mendicant ambassadors and foreign leaders, I also saw something else um, that all department heads might be interested in. He met with his budget director. How much did he meet with his budget director? Before the cabinet meeting, every time. So then in my office, we counted up how many times Coolidge sat and looked with the green eyes shade at his budget. He became president in August 1923, so he could only have 14 meetings with his budget director that year. But the next year, he was in the whole year, 1924, there were 55 full meetings with his budget director. The following year, 52. The following year, 63, and so on. He never relented. And, and that just shows you, you may have heard the famous Coolidge quote of persistence being all. It's not just genius, it's the discipline of doing the work. He said, better to burn the midnight oil than to seek the limelight. And that was evidence of it. Um, one of the stories I followed in the Coolidge book is how he, this played out in his family, this parsimony, not always a, such a friendly way. Um, there was a housekeeper at the White House named Mrs. Jaffray, who was very self-important and had been there a long time, and she liked fancy shops. She went around uh, in a carriage, even in that day. Other people had cars, she went around in a carriage. Coolidge didn't approve of Mrs. Jaffray. She bought too many hams for his taste, and eventually um, he, he told her he wanted her to go to the supermarket, a new supermarket. She didn't like that either, the, the Piggly Wiggly. And soon Mrs. Jaffray was gone, um, and there was a Miss Riley from Boston to keep the books and manage the house 
in the White House. And in my research in Plymouth Notch, Vermont, I found a note about that where she totted up every expense for food in the White House in 1926 and, and in 1927. And the feeding of the White House and all its guests, I can tell you, cost $11,667.10 in 1926 versus $9,116.39 for the year later, a total savings of about $2,500. And Coolidge was so moved that he wrote his staffer a note, silent cow, to Miss Riley, presidential pencil. Very fine improvement. He's always there. This he na you know he named his pets after a budgeting. He had a lion called tax reduction and a lion called budget bureau, and he it, he it was a mania with him, and that was important for the achievements. The colleagues didn't like him. Now you understand why Alice Roosevelt Longworth didn't. He took the fun away from Washington. When Coolidge had a breakfast, usually FaceTime with the president is valuable. I value FaceTime with President Bush now. The senators would run away. They did not want to try his maple syrup. And I found a list of RSVP no's to one presidential breakfast, and I'll read the name. Senator Heflin, regrets, sick. Senator Norris, unable to locate. Would not respond to. <laughs> Sarah Pittman, regrets, sick, cannot attend. Senator Reed of Missouri, regrets, sick friend. They didn't like him because he wouldn't give them anything. That's not the usual way in Washington, but the voters liked him. He won in 1924. He beat the sort of Perot candidate, La Follette, and the Democrat combined, the Democrat and the third party did not have as many votes as Coolidge who commanded an absolute majority. You can spend the whole talk w about what was behind this, and natural humility was one thing. He believed in service. Um, Selden Spencer, who was from Missouri, I walked with him once trying to jolly him, pointed to the White House and said, who lives in that important house? And Coolidge said, nobody does. They just come and go. <laughs> There is also his faith, which was not ancillary, but central, that irked people even in the time. Hoover called Coolidge a fundamentalist. He didn't get it, but Coolidge reported to somebody who was more important than an interest group. That's a simple way to put it. And that entity did not want the government to take all of life. That's a, the simple way of putting it, and, and uh, that was an important part of his philosophy. For today, what can we take away? One is the value of plain language. When we talk now about budget cuts um, in a fancy way that really means reductions in increases in the budget, Coolidge would have rejected that. We should reject it too. We should truly have a wariness of new entitlements and say no to them. We should have a confidence in executive authority. A lot of what I've told you has to do with a powerful executive, unfortunately, that budget law was undone in the 1970s. Um, when one thing that's extremely important that I keep thinking about is that it's the executive who ca has experience with budget and likes budget does better when you need budgets. So that tells us that we should value our, our lawmakers who focus on budgets have a new appreciation for them because Coolidge would not have been able to do what he did without much experience in government budgeting. He cut the budget of Massachusetts before he cut the budget of the federal government. Finally, I think for party, Coolidge did not mind dis distinguishing himself. He, his party was not democrat light. He thought it was fatal to be democrat light. Um, he wouldn't have approved of Alf Landon's campaign in 1936, which was rather close to the New Deal. He had a wonderful quote um, where he spoke about this uh, just before he died, Coolidge, um, at the end of 32. When the American people make a major decision, like election of a president, they do not offer themselves to the highest bidder, but seek to determine conscientiously what justice and true patriotism require them to do. That was a winning line for him. It was 
There are a lot of other things one could say, where it was flawed, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to stop here and say what I like about the Scrooge, Mike Coolidge, was that he makes us optimistic. We don't have a situation as bad as their situation. We don't have riots in the streets. Our unemployment is lower than their unemployment in the early 20s, which was close to 19% some months. So if you ask whether it's really possible to find leadership that can take the country back to growth, I'm going this time to say yes. Thank you very much. We do have time for some questions for Amity. Questions? We have microphones and maybe some. Gentleman right there, Julie. Oh, there you go. Can you tell us uh, what Coolidge's position on prohibition was? Oh, very interesting position. He didn't like prohibition particularly. Why? Because he didn't get tax revenues from the tax. Oh, it, well, one thing it was expensive to enforce. So that that was irritating. But he didn't like it because. Uh, he didn't like laws that people broke because that undermined the law generally. And if, if a law was so wrong that people broke it all the time, maybe you should change the law. But he, he, didn't, but he also thought it was a waste of time, I think. It was a distraction from the true work of cutting the budget. So, so he was a mono-focus uh, type person, and he wasn't going to fight. He picked his battles very carefully. He wasn't going to fight about things that were not the campaign of the year. His son's fraternity, I believe, anyway, in, at Amherst, they had a prohibition challenge in the time his son was there. And I'm just beginning to read up on that. I don't want to misrepresent that. But um, at Amherst, the, so it was in his world all the time because prohibition was a big part of our life. It was hard to enforce whether the treasury should enforce it or another area. But uh, he, he thought it was a waste of time, I think. Yes, um, when he won in 1924, did he have a large electoral college victory? You know, I don't have the chart. I just know that he won the absolute majority in the popular vote. Is there something you know? I don't. He, what I do know is he won California, which is a signal uh, that Republicans wanted to keep California. That was the future, and he did. So he was regarded as Mr. Vote Getter. It, it, the party liked him less than the voters liked him, and he proved that over and over again. Do you know why he didn't seek re-election in 28, and did he regret not running when he saw what Hoover did? Well, this is the end of my book, which is now uh, drafted, um, and I would, that, that chapter is called Coolidge Agonistes, because you do some, when you do something on principle, and, and not everyone always applauds you, do they? And you have to live with it. So he, he did something on principle, which is choose not to run again. Uh, my analysis is that he did it on principle, like Cincinnatus or George Washington, both of whom he studied. He thought it really was, and his, I commend his autobiography to everyone, good for the government to change presidents from time to time. Uh, but of course, other people were not pleased with that. The Republican Party was furious at him because he was a sure winner, and now they had none. They are wonderful cartoons from the period, and so they didn't pat him on the back. Th and he didn't, th that's hard to take. So he had a personal agony of not being rewarded by his party, and of as soon as he stopped, he lost a lot of power, lame duck, and Hoover, even before he was president, began to do things of which Coolidge did not approve. Hoover was a much bigger government uh, fellow, and he couldn't do anything about it without breaking his principles, right? Without abusing his own principles, Coolidge, so he had to watch. And I think when he left Washington, he was very relieved not to have to watch what Herbert <coughs> Hoover did anymore. Uh, what's your recommendation uh, for the situation today to get economic growth going again related to tax rates and other policy changes? Well, um, I'm for a low, simple, we're having a wonderful tax uh, event with the 4% growth project in New York uh, with lawmakers coming and experts coming. Um, and uh, we'll see what solutions they come up with in the solution panel. But personally, I'm for lower, simpler rates and the big emphasis on simplicity and clarity of the regime. If we can't understand the tax regime, 
then we can't change it, and we're all sort of disenfranchised, right? We're, we feel too stupid, we can't even, un so, so I've always been uh, for a clearer, simpler, lower rate, series of rates. The, 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 um, the schedule is way too complicated. And, and this is a good year to have a tax conference because this year the tax is unfortunately going to go up. So we need to remember what that means and what it'll cost. Do you think that uh, he would have ever been elected president on his own had he not achieved it by virtue of being vice president? Um, it's possible. He was quite popular. So if you study the convention of 1920, where the fateful decision at the Blackstone Hotel and the other hotels in Chicago for Harding was made. Um, Coolidge was quite famous because of the Boston police strike, of which I didn't speak, um, where he had stopped a public sector union um, as governor, being firmer than the president, Wilson, uh, in a similar situation. So he's quite famous and quite admired for that. Public sector strikes are disruptive and slow growth. He had stopped one, he should be president. Harding was much loved and already in the Senate. Um, I think Coolidge, looking at the documents and the letters and the rage, Coolidge was a little um, naive to expect he would be nominated for president, and he did expect it, but not too naive. The reason he wasn't, if there was one big one, was a man from his own state, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, wanted to be nominated himself, or at least wanted to be in control, and did not get the state behind the famous governor from Massachusetts, Coolidge. So yeah, I think it was possible. Um, and when Wallace McCammon did <coughs> nominate him for vice president, it was a Westerner who nominated him, th there was a great relief in the hall in Chicago because Harding was a buddy of the other senators but not quite popular enough to be the presidential nominee. So this was the popular man's vice president as opposed to the party machine's vice president, Coolidge. Well, just to answer the question about the election, I think the Pollock carried Wisconsin, Davis carried Wisconsin. Right, it was South, even worse. Yeah, and everything else went for Coolidge. But in history class, it generally it seemed that they taught us that Coolidge had a fear of prosperity, but he was basically letting the economy be undermined to the point that the class was inevitable. Uh, what's your take on that? Well, my take is that there is a, such a thing as a business cycle. And the, 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 there were recessions during Coolidge, before Coolidge. The, the market went too high. So imagine the stock market was 100 for quite a long time, or around there, and then it went up, okay, it went to 381. That's too high, too fast in a couple years. Should it have come down? Yes. Was it going to be awful? Yes. Who knew that? Well, a, a, an investor named Calvin Coolidge knew that. I was just looking at his stock sales and purchases. He knew that. It was time to get out of utilities, get in and then get out, you know, all these things. Everyone knew the stock market was too high. Did they know that 11 years of Great de Depression and um, serious unemployment were coming? No. But in The Forgotten Man, I argue that they, those 11 years not, need not have been 11, that they really could have been four or five or two, uh, it could, um, but for poor policy promulgated by successors to Coolidge. So I, I think it's very hard to hang the whole Great Depression on him, no matter where you're coming from. You can hang a downturn sort of on him. It, his own philosophy was that a downturn was coming, and it would be worse for him to intervene <coughs> and try to prevent a downturn than for the downturn to happen because of the precedent it would set. So that made him sick too. We talked about Coolidge agonists. He knew that there were floods. He knew there were stock market crashes, but he also believed it was wrong for the executive to intervene and made them worse. He, one of the things he did when he retired was he went on the board of a life insurance company. And we, you know, nowadays historians would laugh and say, life insurance is nothing like social security. What a joke, what a comparison, but life insurance is like social security. And if enough people get life insurance and annuities from solid companies, they give themselves some buffer from a downturn. So he believed in private sector solutions when it came to weathering a downturn. Uh, and uh, subsequent events undermined that idea, but it was an interesting idea that it behooves us to review.
I'm curious what uh, Calvin Coolidge's thoughts were on the Federal Reserve created in 1913, and obviously that was a contribution to the bubble that occurred through the 20s. Well, you, um, I think, again, you can look um, in his press conferences, which uh, we've digitized uh, and we'll put online, but are also available edited, abridged, in a nice book, the talkative pres president, that he believed that the Federal Reserve might be wrong, but that it would be wrong for the executive, Coolidge, to intervene. And Hoover got very angry with him at that. Hoover wanted intervention. Maybe Hoover was right. Maybe the Fed was too friendly to England. There's a famous story about the US Fed and Benjamin Strong, the head of our New York Fed, being closer to the central banker in England than he was to the US economy and adjusting monetary policy to help England rather than to help the US. Too tight, too loose at the wrong time. I don't think um, that Fed policy was so bad that we had to have 11 years of Great Depression. So, and I, I actually look at that and forgot, man. Um, I mean, 20, it was off. Um, but again, same thing. He thought, if I intervene, the very fact of the intervention will be worse than the result of the suboptimal current policy. Did Coolidge ever speak about the United Nations, whether he thought we should join it or should not join it? Well, that, that's an important question. Uh, Coolidge was love law. Good question. He loved law. He loved law almost too much. So when the leader of Ethiopia sent him a beautiful, golden, terrifying war shield studded with precious jewels, what did Coolidge send back? Four law books. <laughs> he had that in him. He, in this, he was much like Wilson. He, he was similar to Wilson. So he didn't, wasn't going to be for the League of Nations. His party wasn't for the League of Nations. That was clear. But he, he kind of fooled around with the world court, different versions of it, and he steered, and his, his, his um, Secretary of State Kellogg steered a, a, a remarkably optimistic piece of legislation, the kellogg briand Pact, Outlawing War, which he signed in one, as one of his last acts as president. So you can argue, how bad was that? that act. Maybe we're for it. Maybe it was good. We agree. This was the law, the outlawry of war. Or maybe it was bad. Maybe if it gave Mussolini a license to trash Ethiopia. You know, I mean, either, but he kind of favored international law as long as it was his kind of law, which is more Anglo-American than current international law. More like England than like France. And we thank you very much. Well, thank you.